Thank you, everyone, for having me. Greetings. Okay, thank you for having me. Today I'm here to share with you about herbal medicine, growing, creating your own herbal apothecary. And I'd like to just begin by telling you a little bit about my journey. And this whole presentation is going to be a lot of pictures and information about my farm and how I came to grow over 100 different varieties of medicinal plants and how we process them and what we do with them. But I'd like to kind of share a little to begin with how we started our farm. Um, we've been in El Cervante on three acres for a almost 10 years. And we started out um, really as a su sustainable farm for our family of four. So really a big experiment on what could we do, uh, how much could we grow that we consume. And little by little, uh, our progression started with perennial and uh, annual vegetables, with poultry, with um, Jersey cows and sheep and bees. So we have quite a diverse homestead. And about three years ago, we transitioned from growing mainly annual and perennial vegetables to uh, a huge garden of, of herbal medicinals. And that's also the time when we began our herb herbal and permaculture design school. So I've been working with medicinal plants since I was a very small child, uh, about four years old is when I started. And I grew up in the East Coast in Connecticut, running through the fields and forests and making plant medicine with willow catkins and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then ended up going through uh, many different programs. I've been learning, studying, and teaching herbal medicine for 22 years, um, starting out at the California School of Herbal Studies up in Forestville, a little north of Sebastopol. Um, but have been foraging and, and growing medicinals for about the last 10 years on our farm. Um, Something happened. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I'm not sure. Is it? Does it come off? Um, that one's not on. Is this one working okay? Should I just keep going? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get into uh, all, a lot of the different plants that we grow and what we do with them. Uh, so establishing, the first garden that we established on our farm was a medicine wheel, a Native American medicine, medicine wheel garden. And that's what you're seeing um, right behind in full bloom. Um, and that is uh, mainly native annual and perennial um, herbals that we use on a daily basis in our kitchen and also to make medicine with for our family. And then, like I said, three years ago, when we established our school, the beginning of our herb school, we started to cultivate a larger medicinal garden um, down on our south-facing hillside slope. So this is in the first year, um, the end of the first year, when the garden was just starting to really bloom. And at this point, it's three years old. And some examples of some of the herbs that we have growing are mullein. <clears throat> and how many people out here are herbalists or work with herbs? Raise your hand. Quite a few. Okay, great. So we grow uh, mullein, you know, for our upper respiratory tract issues. We grow wormwood is another favorite artemisia. Yellow dock is a wild um, edible and medicinal that grows on our farm. Lots of rosemary and dandelion for our liver support. We also have a lot of fennel for digestive aid and issues. And this beautiful plant is in the mint family. It's called wild daga, or also lion's ear or lion's tail. And it is an entheogenic plant that is used, um, it's a South African native, and used um, in a lot of ritual and ceremony with the shamans and medicine people in South Africa. So other, other some other plants that we grow that are also food as medicine, um, a lot of garlic for its antibacterial properties. and nettles. So now getting into kind of wild crafting and the ethics and um, medicinal herbs that are in the wild. There's so many species of wild edible and medicinal plants. California is very abundant. Um, if I was stuck on a desert island and I had, could only have one plant, it would be the stinging nettle. This is my favorite plant. 
It's like, I like to call it kind of like the green goddess plant because it makes you glow. Um, your hair, your nails, your blood, it just builds everything and helps to nourish you so deeply. So I do grow nettle on my farm, but not very much because I like to forage um, every spring. I forage usually enough for the year. Um, and I have my special spots I like to go to. Um, in the spring, my whole farm is covered with cleavers. Um, and cleavers is one of my favorite lymphatic herbs, very gentle. I love to use this herb in tincture, but my favorite use for it is to actually juice it. So just blending it fresh in the blender and the Vitamix with water and a, and a lemon, and then straining that pulp out and drinking the fresh green juice. And that's an amazing spring tonic, the cleavers. And then, of course, we have our wild, um, our wild native elderberry, which is the blue elderberry or the Mexican elderberry, which grows all along the creeks and, and hillsides near our home. And every fall or late summer, now the seasons are kind of shifting back in California, but um, late summer, I harvest pounds. I think last year I had like over 100 pounds of elderberry that I harvested and made a lot of syrups, syrups and tincture um, and even elderberry, elderberry fire cider. Keep going. Oh, and well now it's working. Okay. Um, okay. Swap to that one. Is that one? Find out. Hello, hello. Okay, hello. Oh, push the very bottom. Okay, there we go. All right, technical difficulties. So elderberry is also very abundant. Um, the berry, the leaf, you can use for medicine. Um, one of my other favorites is the California sagebrush, which is the, a native sage. It's actually native artemisia um, that grows all over the hillsides in um, the maritime areas, but also the really dry hillsides. And I love to use this plant uh, usually as a smudge. So a smudge is a plant that we burn for purification, protection, cleansing, um, energetically. And then uh, this is a juniper tree that grows along one of the hiking trails near my home. And I collect the leaves and the berries and the sap for medicine. So it's another beautiful grandfather tree that I like to harvest from. And then one of my other favorite medicines, uh, one of our most potent antibacterials in the herbal kingdom, or this is actually a, uh, an algae and a fungus combined um, into a lichen, is usnea. So I like to harvest a lot of usnea to put into my salves and tinctures. And then I'm not an expert at medicinal mushrooms, but I do know, you know certain varieties that are pretty safe to harvest, like turkey tail which is proven to have wonderful immuno immunological properties. So I do like to harvest turkey tail. And then I also grow um, different times. I've grown um, both shiitake and oyster, oyster mushrooms on our farm as well. And then um, some of the food that we grow that I also use for medicine is corn. So I like to, every year, I'm obsessed with growing all different varieties of uh, heirloom corns. And so last year I grew three kinds, the strawberry popping corn. And this is kind of like a cross that I've made between the Oaxacan, blue, Oaxacan green and Hopi blue corns. Um, so this is like our own, what we, what we achieved on our farm, our own crosses and varieties. And I grow the corn for food, but I also grow it for the corn silk. So the corn silks are the, the medicinal aspect that I use. So just to talk a little bit about um, ethics of harvesting and etiquette. You know, every herbalist and every person working with plants has their own personal relationship with plant spirits and honoring and respecting the plants. I have a very specific way that I like to go about working with plants. And I think it's really important to say that and acknowledge, uh, for me, uh, that plants are, are living, breathing, sentient beings. And they are very different than we are. Um, they have a different way of communicating. They have their own way of being. And that doesn't make us superior 
or more evolved than they are. And I think it's really important that when we work with them or even just are in relationship with them, that we honor them just as we would honor another friend or human that we're developing a relationship with. So just as when you're meeting a new friend, you want to put time and energy into that relationship, it's the same with the plant or with any type of uh, herbal medicine that you're working with. It takes time to establish a relationship and it takes respect. So I like to go through a three or four step process every time I'm harvesting um, or I'm, a, I'm intending to harvest either wild or cultivated plants. And so my first step is always that I approach with respect, that I approach with the intention of peace and harmony and stating my intention. I always like to tell the plants what I'm going to be, you know, what I'm asking for and what I'm going to use them for. And then I always, second step is give an offering. And so many people give different offerings. For me, I, I usually, I grow tobacco and I grow corn on my farm, so I like to harvest those and I always save some for offering. Uh, sometimes I give my blood, sometimes I give my saliva. There's so many different things you can give. Other people you know, might give water, or once you get into a deeper relationship with plants, they'll actually tell you what specific offering they would like you to give them. Um, but my very favorite offering is to give them a song. So if you have a song in your heart that comes up, often that's the plant speaking to you, and you can sing to the plant. You can, I like to play my flute sometimes as well. So step number two is giving an offering. And then step number three, I always ask permission. And so that can be out loud, it can be in my heart, but communicating with the plants and always asking their permission before taking and listening. And that can take, it can be instantaneous, it can be a minute, it can be five minutes, but being patient and really listening to what that message is. And sometimes it's a very clear, resounding yes, and sometimes it's a clear no, and sometimes it's a whole bunch more information that you didn't expect. Um, and I have that relationship with different plants on my farm. Some of them are really finicky and vain, and they only want me to harvest them very symmetrically, or they only want certain times of the year it's okay to harvest. So some of them have sense of humor, yeah. Um, and then after that, it's um, harvesting with respect and always taking just the amount that I'm going to use and giving thanks and gratitude. So I think it's important to to speak that process. And everyone may have a different process, but that's mine. Um, so always being respectful of our plant, plant sisters and plant friends. And then, move on with the slides. So then the process of actually harvesting. So for me, so these are pictures of just different harvest days on the farm. So we do different, um, depending on the season and what we're harvesting, but I usually lay out like big sheets or or cloths and harvest in bundles and uh, take time to actually separate everything. And I use the method of drying. If, if I'm harvesting flowery, leafy plants, then I take the time to bundle everything and hang them in my herb shed to dry upside down. And I take the time also to label each bundle with a small tag with the date and the name of the plant because you know, especially if I'm harvesting a whole lot of plants, um, once they dry, they often don't look the same as they did fresh, and sometimes it's hard to tell a, a peppermint from a spearmint from a bergamot. You know, it's like they're dry and, and all crackly. You can't really always tell exactly what they are, so it's important to label. So here's just some pictures of different harvests. And then um, herbs hanging in the herb shed. So this is my little herb shed. Soul Flower Farm is the name of our farm. So here I have hanging mullein leaf, really super huge that season, huge mullein leaf. Uh, hyssop, mullein, uh, tulsi, and red onions. So some people do this method of drying um, in bundles. Some people dry in brown paper bags out of direct sunlight. Some people might dry on a dehydrator. Uh, so this is like a, a makeshift um, dehydrator. You can just use window screens. It's just important that you have good ventilation and that you have your plants out of direct sunlight. Um, and I find in our climate, we're in El Cerbrante, 10 miles north of Berkeley, Depending on the time of year, my plants usually take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks to dry. 
So this time of year when we're getting this, that heat that we just had earlier in the week, um, the plants might dry in a few days. It could be really fast. Um, and later in the winter, it could take several weeks. And I might have to keep a fan blowing. So that's just a little bit about harvesting the, the aerial parts or the leafy flowering parts of the plants. And then when we get into harvesting roots, um, we are going to be digging the roots. And this is a picture of me harvesting elecampane roots in the garden. So I would harvest them. And then usually the technique that I do is I, I outside have a bucket of water. I put all the roots in the water so that I don't have to waste a lot of water. And I just scrub all the excess soil off the roots and then bring them inside, rinse them again. And depending on how fat they are, I'll sit with shears and cut them into little slivers and then <clears throat> excuse me, dry them on the dehydrator rack. So the elecampane root tent doesn't tend to be that fat. Um, in the fall, last fall, I harvested poke root, which was the size of my bicep. <laughs> so I had, with that, I had to use loppers and a saw to actually get through that. And it's, it's really woody. So all, and then, you know, also I was harvesting valerian, which is really spindly and very thin. And so they're all, they have different qualities. Um, but here's a picture of once it's dry. So I make sure that it's dry um, to a crisp. And then at that point, Everything gets stored in glass gallon jars with the name, the date, and the origin of where it was harvested from. So it's really important to make sure that all the moisture is dried out of the plant before it's jarred up. This is just a picture of the beginning of my apothecary, and now it's grown much bigger. <clears throat> but as long as it's out of direct sunlight, you can keep your plants on shelves. Some people like to keep them in the dark. I don't tend to do that because I use them pretty quickly. So then getting into some medicine making, uh, well, I guess I'll just back up for a second and say that out of all of the herbs that I make my medicines with, about 90 plus percent, maybe 95 percent, are herbs that I grow or wildcraft. So it used to be when I was starting out that I would buy a lot of herbs from um, Mountain Rose Herbs or like different online companies or even local growers. Um, and now I'm really trying to stick with uh, using um, you know, as much of what I'm growing and wildcrafting as possible and really trying to grow the majority and not make such a dent on the wild wild places. So getting into medicine making, so here's some picture of making some tea blends. So the teas can be made with roots, flowers, leaves, bark, whatever your fancy, whatever you're using. But this is a picture of a winter wellness tea that has, uh, this one has hibiscus, satsuma orange from our orchard, olive leaf, and echinacea. And then there's also a spiritual cleansing bath tea and a dream pillow blend. This is a picture of like a citrus, uh, turmeric, salt scrubs. So there's all different types of medicine making that is possible. I make tea blends, tinctures, glycerites, salves, lotions, salt scrubs, deodorants, dream pillows, smudge sticks, and herbal smoking blends. So there's so many different options. Some glycerites. This is an elderberry glycerite. And for those of you who aren't clear on what a glycerite is, there's different liquid extracting agents that you can use to extract the chemical constituents from the plants to make it into medicine. And when you make a tincture, most people use either alcohol, uh, food grade vegetable glycerin, or apple cider vinegar. Some people use wine. Um, there's different liquids you can use to extract the medicine out of the plants. So I usually use a combination. I like to, and those liquid extracts are called, li liquid agents are called menstruums. And I like to mix my menstruums, meaning I like to make, uh, I might usually out add the alcohol to the glycerin together, or I might add some honey into the alcohol, because I like to make tasty, yummy medicine. Nobody wants yucky medicine. Um, <laughs> um, so here's a citrus bliss. This is a bitters formula and uh, Nervine Love and Support. So this is like for the nervous system support formula. 
So there's so many different possibilities, um, and I like to work with just basically what's seasonal, what's growing, uh, what's coming up, when it's coming up, and uh, the plants will also tell you who likes to go, who likes to grow with who, and also who wants to go into the jar with who, once you really start to have that relationship with them. So we also keep bees. We have a nice apiary of bees on our farm. And another uh, method of medicine making is to make medicinal honeys. So uh, I love to do, uh, this is like an OSHA black seed, OSHA root black seed honey. Um, I love to do like a turmeric ginger black pepper honey, uh, Ella Campaign wild cherry bark, like a cough honey. There's endless possibilities. Nettle powder with spirulina and moringa. I mean, you can do so many different things and just you have an instant medicinal tea that you can just add hot water to. And then getting into making herbal oils and salves. So there's so many different methods. Um, different people have different ways that they do it. I do almost all of my herbal uh, oil infusions into crock pots. So I have many different crock pots lined up uh, outside and I try to use um, both the, the heat of the sun and also electricity. So I tend to infuse my herbal oils for 10 days to a month because I want them to be really, really potent. So I might start out with a clear coconut oil and at the end of that 20 or 30 days, it's black because it's infused with so many of the properties of the plants. So I tend to like might turn the crock pot on low for you know the daytime or the nighttime and then turn it off and let the sun heat it during the day. So as, as little electricity as possible. And this is the beginnings of uh, like an all-purpose healing salve. It has calendula, rosemary, lavender, uh, California blue sage, white sage. And then this is the beginnings of uh, my, one of my favorite salves that I make is called tree salve. And so I make it with all the di different medicinal trees on our property. Um, it has uh, cedar, pine, Monterey pine, eucalyptus, redwood, camphor, uh, willow. Um, and I gather all the leaves and some of the bark and infuse that into, usually I use olive and coconut, extra virgin olive and organic coconut and infuse that for again a month and then strain that out and add beeswax and you have a lovely dark uh, salve, and I use that tree salve like an herbal neosporin. So it's a very strong antimicrobial, antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, and you can use that for any first aid issues that you need. So and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, more like selling and marketing your medicinals. Um, you can do all of this for your home, for your family, for your community. Um, I'm a community herbalist. I'm also, I have a private practice, so I make a lot of medicine for my clients, and also I make a lot of medicine to sell. Um, at the, I sell at the farmer's market every week in Berkeley. And I've been selling at small markets and festivals for um, almost 20 years. And the reason for me why I love to do that is, one, when you're growing a lot of plants, you always have way more than you can use yourself. And there's something so beautiful and important about giving back and sharing that medicine. And every single person, like every single one of you, I could give you calendula, lavender, and sage, and you could make a salve. And every single one of those salves would be different because everyone has their own medicine that they put, their own intention, their own touch, their own love. Like all of us have a different energy. And so there's something really special about being able to offer, it's like an art, a science, and a gift uh, to be an herbal medicine maker. So here's just some pictures of different medicines and uh, selling at the farmer's market. So I sell at the Tuesday South Berkeley Farmer's Market and the Saturday Downtown Berkeley Farmer's Market. And, you know, one of the things I also like to share with people sometimes is that it's such an honor to be an intermediary between plants and people. And it's also, it's a traditional niche or role that every indigenous culture had. And in our modern society, people are so removed and disconnected from their food, their medicine, the land, the soil. And to be able to have this beautiful job of 
connecting with the plants and making medicine and then giving that to the community is such a very, like I have so much gratitude for being able to have that role. And there's something that as I've been doing this work for years, especially for almost two years um, working in a larger population at the farmer's market, because I serve the same group of people for the most part, I'd say like 85 to 90% of the farmer's market customers are the same people every week. Not only do they come and they take my same tincture, like you might take my adaptogen tincture and like it, and go through six bottles. And then you can come back and you can give me that feedback because you've truly embodied that medicine and you can really tell me exactly how rooted you feel and how strong you feel from that medicine. And so I'm learning so much more about the medicine from all the feedback. And then there's something really, really magical that I want to share with you that I think was a traditional knowledge that is not, um, not very many people are aware of anymore. But I get to see, you know, maybe on a weekly basis, 60, 70 people might come to my booth. And it could be springtime. And maybe 55 of those people tell me that they have anxiety and they're having sleep, trouble sleeping. And so I can see week to week, month to month, season to season, the trends. We're not individuals. We're a collective and we're all connected. And we're all experiencing the same things, whether it's seasonal, energetic, or from watching too much media or whatever. Everyone's f afraid, you know. But all of this, this is like a, it's a trend that happens. Everyone has the same issues. And then at the same time that everyone's having anxiety and insomnia, all the poppies are blooming. And all the St. John's wort is coming up. And all the skull cap is ready. And all those nervine support is available for us. And the plants are responding to uh, us and we're responding to them. So there's this mimicking and this beautiful connection that's happening that not very many people are watching, but I get to see. So I'm very honored to have that position and to be able to be still, still enough and have the time to pay attention and listen. So these are just some more pictures of uh, different tinctures and products that I have teas and salves and incense blends. This is a sacred earth incense blend with white sage, four, the four sacred herbs, tobacco, white sage, cedar, and sweet grass. So this is for burning and for offering. And I also like to do sometimes rose petals or calendula in there, different roots, just depends on how I'm feeling, but it's always nice to have an offering blend that you travel with so that, you know, if you're, if you're a plant person, you always have to have your kit. You have to have your knife, your scissors, your offering, like all of that. I always have a cloth for gathering. So some beautiful white sage. OK. Smudges, dream pillows. So another, another way to work with herbs is to do an herbal CSA. And so we have uh, CSA is Community Supported Agriculture, um, and we have a kind of like a Community Supported Herbalism CSA. So we do a seasonal uh, basket that you can buy, you can purchase either for a household of one to two or a family size household. And it's all themed by, the medicine is uh, the theme of the season. So for example, Fall would be immunity and energy. Springtime would be rejuvenation and cleansing, liver support, gallbladder. So it just goes by the season and by what's growing. Um, and so that's a really beautiful way to get your medicine. And then these are, I'm just going to share kind of some more uh, information about just ways to promote your herbal business or um, other offerings that we have. So. Uh, doing different shows and doing demonstrations. Uh, I also offer a, an herbal apprenticeship. Um, that's a four-month-long seasonal apprenticeship. And so people come and work once a week um, for the whole day and get a hands-on experience. Um, this is a flyer for our school, so we have all sorts of classes on herbal studies and permaculture design. Um, like herbal walks, herbal medicine making, um, different body systems courses, healing with the seasons, lots of community processing of herbs. 
And then through all these classes, like for me, one of the reasons why it's so important to, once you're you know, establishing your relationship with plants and you're making your medicine and you can share it with your family, your community, uh, it's also so important to pay it forward and share your knowledge. So whether you're teaching community classes or you're just sharing it with your family or the youth um, in your area, in your neighborhood, um, paying it forward by sharing what you've learned. And everyone has different information that they get from the plants, especially if you work more energetically and spiritually with the plant medicine, you know, the plants are going to tell you something maybe totally different than they would tell me. So these are just some more pictures of um, different herbal gatherings, the Wise Women's Healing Retreat at our farm. Uh, we have an upcoming, um, in a couple of weeks, an Ecoprint Natural Dye Workshop with Corey Gunter Brown, who used to have the moon in Oakland. It's a wonderful class. We just had this Tree Medi Magic um, Ancestral Healing with Tree Essences. And I just want to say, um, going back to offering, going back to offerings, there was the, during this class um, last Sunday, we did a lot of plant journeys. So you take a little bit of the plant essence. Um, in this case, it was uh, the flower essence of the flowers from the trees. And then we do a journey with the plants, with the essence. And one of the trees that we worked with was magnolia. And I was saying before, you know, for me, I like to offer cornmeal or tobacco or my blood or saliva or a song um, or a little bit of hair. <clears throat> but magnolia clearly communicated with several of the women in the class through the journey um, that sh she likes to have honey as uh, an offering, and please bring children around me. And I thought that was just so beautiful. It almost made me cry. But it makes sense if you think of magnolia with its huge blossoms and how the bees love it. Like, of course it loves honey, you know? So just the magic of the plant medicine. Afrobotany is another um, beautiful course that we're developing and reviving, working a lot with pain management. So another product or um, formula that I love to make. So I do grow cannabis and I work a lot with cannabis in um, topical medicine and tinctures. And I make a restoration and pain salve with uh, the whole plant, whole above ground parts. So not just the, what is that? Not just the trim, but the whole bud, leaf, stem, everything. Arnica, willow bark, like all these pain herbs infused into the oils. And it's been amazing to watch hundreds of different people using the salve that, you know, didn't want to use steroid injections and just need to manage their chronic pain and that it's helping them. So it's very rewarding work. Herbal antibiotics and herbal antivirals. So this is kind of another next level for me of... Uh, thinking about working with plant medicine and developing my herbal apothecary. Uh, I am a bit of a prepper, <laughs> so I do think a lot about when there, what's going to happen when there aren't stores and when there aren't hospitals and how are we going to heal ourselves and take care of ourselves. And for me, one of the first things is preventative medicine, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves so that we don't get sick. But if we do, what are the plants that are available to us in our area? Not coming from China, Siberia, India, but like what is growing right where we live that's acclimated to our bodies that we can use that can help us. So it's food for thought. Some different flyers. Um, I also really love teaching herbal medicine to children. So again, paying it forward, um, groups of homeschoolers, um, just did a really great herbal medicine making class at Castlemont High School in East Oakland with 30 kids and adults, and that was fantastic. Everybody was so enthusiastic. Um, making, uh, we made immunity syrup and uh, herbal, like a strong and resiliency tea, and we made uh, an all-purpose salve and a uh, spring, like bitters liver tincture. It's pretty amazing. So just pictures of different groups. So I think that's mainly it. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, thank you.
First, thank you so much. Um, I had a farm for 10 years, and so coming into communion, it, I wasn't raised on a farm. Yeah. And so that process that you go through is really beautiful. So my question is, if someone has never grown anything before, um, do you have a recommendation of how to come into communion with the things that you're wanting to um, make partnership with? Um, meaning plants or animals or either or I mean, things how you have I mean yeah. I find that I have a lot easier time um, with animal husbandry and listening and communicating than I do with plants but I mm -hmm. think it's because I haven't fully you know given one the same time that I have the other mm -hmm. and maybe that's more your gift you know working with plants is not everyone's gift and we all have our different purposes um, I mean, just time, you know, I feel like taking your time, just like if you meet someone and you have that spark and you're really excited and you, you put time into it, you put your energy, you put your love. And so just patience and effort, anything, anytime you want to cultivate something beautiful, you put your full self in. So, I mean, there's also something that I read, um, I don't I hope this is not too personal, but I feel safe in this space saying um, that I read a book, a really interesting book a while back about um, working with our blood. Um, and so putting our blood on the land um, and actually raises the vibration and attracts in different, uh, attracts plants and animal life of a higher vibration and of a vibrational frequency that matches us and what we need. So... Yeah, and, and also like planting our vegetables and our um, fruit and our food by the astral cycles and working with more of like a holistic way of working is, is going to like hone everything in. But that just takes listening. And it, sometimes it's a rote kind of mundane thing that you start out doing, but as it gets into be a, a pattern, then it just becomes natural and then the magic starts to happen. So does that answer your question? It totally does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I was wondering about the the tinctures that you're uh, making that that sit for months on end until they turn black. Oh, okay. That, the oils. The, the oils. These oils. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and how does that change the? I'm sure it changes the consistency, but how does it change the action of the herbs? So what I'm doing is I'm using the method of the crock pot, which is giving very gentle heat mm -hmm. um, to the oil combination with the herbs. And I'm, I'm, the most I might let it sit is for one month. So anywhere from 10 days to a month, I'm keeping it on the warm setting so that if you stick your finger in, it's not too hot for your, it's like blood warm. And the, the gentle heat is just helping the action of the plants to release their chemical constituents into the oil. So it's just making a much, much more potent end product than if you just put your dried herbs in a jar with oil on the windowsill for two weeks. Because that's another method. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Could you tell us the name of the book you referenced about putting blood, the blood? in the blood? Yeah, land? it's called Earth by um, Barbara Marciniak. Does anyone know? Marciniak? Marciniak? Oh, that. yes. Yeah. I know who she is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, just Earth? Earth. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Th thank you so much for your share and speaking so honestly around your communication with plants. I've, I find I have a personal relationship and it can be hard to convey that to a lot of people. And I'm curious, um, when you're talking about having dialogue with your plants, what that looks like to you. And mm -hmm. Well, definitely it's not about something that I hear in my ear. It's always a feeling in my heart. And so, um, like, I'll just tell you a little story, okay? So I have been working on my, the land where we're stewarding for, yeah, like eight, last year was like eight and a half years, and cultivating this relationship with the plants just day in, day out, you know, honoring them, being respectful, caring for them. But the medicine plants, not so much, because you don't want to baby them. You want them to have like a you want them to struggle so they'll be potent medicine. If you give them too much compost and water, they're kind of, medicine's weak, you know. Um, but just working with them, but never really feeling like I was getting their songs or, like, I can hear sometimes songs from in the wild, but in the garden, I, it's just like a regular, like, I'm the steward. I feel like I'm the steward. 
And then in December, my mom had a stroke and I was away from my farm um, in the hospital with her and um, was gone for maybe like a good solid week, day and night, maybe a little longer. And when I came back, um, and I don't know if any of you know about um, devas, like the devas of the land. So I never connected with the deva of the land. I always, I had worked with someone who like did a reading with me and said the deva was kind of far away and like that my area that I was stewarding was maybe on the edge of, of that entity's um, reach. And maybe because I had been taking care of the land, that energy didn't need to do so much where I was. But I came back from the hospital and I had my first night's sleep and I woke up and I went straight out into the garden barefoot. And everything, I started walking down the hill to where the medicine garden is and it was like literally a purple glow around the whole garden. And the middle of the medicine garden, I have two big abuelita, they're like the Mexican marigold uh, plants. And they were literally glowing purple. And I actually ran and got my phone and took a picture and I, you could see it in the picture. And I felt like, at first I felt like, oh, is this the plant spirit like showing, communicating with me something, like telling me it's, it's okay, like everything's gonna be okay. But I actually, after meditating with, on it, I really felt like it was the deva had come when I was gone and like took care of everything for me. So I don't really feel like there's any one way of knowing, it's just, it happens. And for me, being on one piece of land for a consistent amount of time, you get to know that place so well through all the seasons, through all the days, through the nights, through the cold, through the hot, through the dry, through the wet. And you know all the minutia of the insect life and, and everything that's happening. And so it's kind of like an extension. We're just connected. And, but that takes time. It took time. I didn't have that the moment I landed there. So, yeah. But yeah. now it's, very, it's a very strong connection. Yeah. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Oh, I do, um, in case you're interested, I do just have a few ref resources for books. If you are interested, um, I can just name them off. So the Medicine Maker's Handbook by James Green is a really kind of just a Bible of medicine making, herbal medicine making. Um, Working the Roots is one of my newest favorite by Michelle E. Lee, who's a local Oakland author. It's all about 400 years of African-American healing traditions. Um, the Herbal Handbook by David Hoffman. Um, herbal Antibiotics and Herbal Antivirals by Stephen Butner. Botany in a Day by Thomas Alpel. Adaptogens by David Winston. Um, the Uses of Wild Plants by Frank Tozer and Pacific Seaweeds. So those are some of my favorite, favorite books. Okay, thank you.